Test, test, test. We got it. All right. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Joel Cardella. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about decisions and decision making and some of the interesting experiences that I've had with decision making um, in the various roles that I've kept over the years. Um, there's my information if you want to connect with me, and please connect with me. Um, I'm, I'm a talker. Um, I'm always willing to have conversations with people. One of the interesting things about InfoSec is we're kind of on an island, and it's hard sometimes to really hook up with people and talk about some of the problems that we have, because either the problems are so strange and unique to the things that you do that maybe you, you can't quite get that conversation going, or maybe they're so terrible that you can't actually have a conversation that you want to because, well, you know, things are going really bad and we don't really know how to, to communicate what it is we're trying to communicate without giving away, you know, terrible details about the things that we're dealing with. So it's kind of a lonely space that we live in. Um, I was a CISO for a number of years. And it was a tough job. It was a tough job not necessarily because of the things that I did in InfoSec. It was a tough job because I didn't have any peers. I had nobody I could go to. I had nobody I could really sit with and talk about the, the, the things that were going on organizationally or the problems or the actual attacks that were going on. And, and how do you defend against these and what do you do? Um, you know, we don't have that, that information sharing capability in InfoSec because there's still kind of a, a veil of secrecy around some of the things that we do. So I thought a lot about that when I was in that job, and now I'm in a job where I'm a consultant, and I get to go and I help clients, and I can help them make those decisions. So the cool part about the job that I have is I can fulfill that role. I can sit down because we've signed an NDA, and we can talk about all the crazy things that you're going through and, and determine you know, how can you get through these things or what paths can you take, um, what directions can you go in. So effective decision making is really, really a, a tool that you can use to to, to go forward to succeed. So if you're a decision maker or whether you work with decision makers, um, it, it's the same story. Everybody has to make decisions at some point. And we're not always confident in our decisions. Sometimes that imposter syndrome kicks in. Um, very often I give talks at, at places like this and I just think, I don't know why anybody would want to come see this talk or hear about it at all, right? Because it, it's like, it's interesting to me, it's not interesting to other people. Um, and it's the same with your decisions. You make a decision and you go, I don't know if this is the right decision. I don't know if people are going to come to the same conclusion. I don't know if they're going to think the right things. The purpose of this talk is not necessarily to tell you how to make good decisions. I don't necessarily make good decisions, okay? I wore socks with lobsters on them. I may not be qualified to make good decisions, right? So you have to decide that for yourself. In decision makers, though, we also have risk managers, right? Maybe you are a risk manager yourself, or maybe you know a risk manager. And sometimes these worlds are very different worlds. People who make decisions are not necessarily the people who take risks, or the people who are, are charged to make the decision have to take a certain amount of risk, and they have to do something about that. They have to do something with it. But it's hard. It's difficult. When it comes to risk itself, what is risk? Right? And you have to think about that. What is risk? Risk is entirely contextual. It's all based on what the, the, the parameters under which you're working are driving you to whatever decisions it is you need to make, right? Like the guy who's jumping off the cliff on the bungee. For a fat dude in InfoSec who averages 469 steps a day, I might think twice about doing that, right? That may not be a risk I want to take. But if you're somebody who's fairly fit and you like the outdoors and you're like, oh, come on, it can handle at least 300 pounds, I'm good, maybe you'll take that leap, right? That's up to you. All of those things could be risky things. Maybe they're not to you. Risk is a really difficult thing to deal with. It's a really difficult thing to conceptualize. It's a really difficult thing to constrain. And in business, these are the things that we have to do. Because in order for us to do business, we have to understand what our risks are, what our risk boundaries are, and to really do well how to extend past those risk boundaries. And in order to do that, it all comes down to effective decision making. And again, it's not always about being effective with your decision making. Risk changes based on the observer. All right, you can look at any one of those images and you can see different things depending on who you are. And that's the same in the world of risk. When you sit and you look at a problem and you're trying to determine what it is you need to do about that thing, whatever that thing is, it's completely different to you than it is to someone else. So when you make a decision based on whatever that is, and that other person that you're working with or that you're reporting to doesn't come to the same conclusion, we run into some difficulties. But you have to make the decision. At some point, something has to happen where you just have to, to take that breath and do it, right? So you have to make your decision. So the point of this talk, again, is not on how to make the decision. I'm going to assume that you can make decisions, good or bad, right? 
Bad decisions can make you the president of the United States, as we've learned, right? It's very, very possible to make bad decisions and still succeed. It's very possible. So again, this is not about how to make effective decisions. This is about how to take the decisions that you do make and do something with them, right? So one of the things you may be asked to do is justify your decisions. And this is a difficult position to be in. So you've, you've encountered some risk, you've made a decision, and then somebody says, why did you make that decision? What, what, what conclusions did you come to? How can you convince me that you made the right decision? And it's not always a black and white issue, right? Especially with justification. We have to learn how to justify what it is we do, wh whatever decisions we make. So here's an interesting psychological experiment. Um, they sat down three test groups, and they showed them these two images. And they asked the first test group, they said, please choose the image that you liked best. And the majority, the vast majority of the people, chose the abstract image. Then the second group of people, they said, choose the image you like best, but tell us why you liked it best. And what happened was completely the opposite. Most people chose the image of the trees. Because when they were asked to actually justify what it is about something they liked, they couldn't deal with working in the abstract. They had to work in, in the, the, the solid, right, in the concrete steps. So it's an interesting way the human mind works. When we're asked to justify our decisions, suddenly our minds can change. Which means, if you're a decision maker or you're making decisions, having that justification going into the decision is going to yield better results for you because you're going to be more equipped to handle it from a left brain, right brain kind of perspective. When it comes to information, there is a knowledge information in hierarchy, or sorry, a hierarchy of knowledge with, with decision making, right? If you're making decisions at that gut level, which sometimes you have to make, it's going to be difficult to justify those decisions. But they are appropriate sometimes. Sometimes you have to make decisions in the moment. You don't have a lot of information. There's not a lot you can do. Boom, gut instinct is what you go with. Then the next level after gut instinct is data. We're starting to organize our gut instincts into, into data that we can process, that we can do something with, right? And at this level, justification becomes a little bit easier because now at least we've got things that we can show people, right? Then we can organize data into information. Now with information, we can start to, to ask and answer questions, which is a really, really important part of decision making, right? Why did I make that decision? This is why. I had these, these particular uh, constraints. I had these particular inputs. I came up with these particular outputs. And then at the, at the top of that is knowledge, where we're actually imparting knowledge, right? This allows us to organize information in such a way that that, organ, that, that information can be distributed and people can learn. So when it comes to justification, and you're talking about the things that you need to justify, the decisions you need to justify, right? at what level are you making these decisions is what you have to, to, to really ask yourself. right? And I'm not saying get bogged down in the data. I'm not saying wait to make a decision until you have enough data. I'm saying that at some point when you're asked to make a decision, you're going to be somewhere in this hierarchy, and you're going to need to do something with it, whatever that thing is. right? And being aware of where you're at in that hierarchy will help you in that justification. So, some tips for justifying your decisions. Number one, don't use self-justification. This is an emotional trap, right? If you are emotionally connected to a thing and you are trying to justify your decision, whatever it is, using self-justification, because I know best, right? Because um, I had the most, um, you know, uh, I, had the, I was the most vetted in this, this particular um, capacity, right? Self-justification, not a great way to justify a decision. You want to you want to take a step back and you want to use justification methods that don't include the emotional part of you, okay? And you don't want to flee reality. You don't want to go too far out of the bounds. In infosec, we do this all the time. This is what FUD is: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The reality is this thing happened. The non-reality is all this stuff could have happened, right? We have to compartmentalize that. What is the reality of what we're trying to deal with? What is the reality of the decision? You know, zero days. When we deal with zero days, what's the reality of zero days hitting you, you know, right before or right after they're found out? Right? If, the, if, if it's very high, that's your reality. If it's very low, that is not your reality. Your reality is something different. So you have to frame it and think about what is the reality in which I work and how do I make the decisions within that reality so when I justify it, it's easier for me to do. It's not about what could happen. It's about what did happen or, or what is happening. These are really important things. And use positive narratives, please. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt needs to go away. InfoSec needs to move away from this. This was the way. 
This was the way to get budget. This was the way to build structure. This was the way to, to validate security, but it's not anymore. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt are no longer the tools of security practitioners. They're the enemy of security practitioners, right? Because there's opposites of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's apathy, right? Which is the, the opposite of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And if you're trying to instill fear in people to get them to act, and they go apathetic, you've lost the, the, the case, you've lost the argument. You will not be able to move forward. It's gonna be very, very difficult for you to do anything with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So positive narratives, right? What are the things we can accomplish? What are the things we need to achieve? I base this decision based on the possible, right? That's, that's the, the positive in, in the reality. Nonverbal matters. When you're having a specific discussion with somebody, right, and your arms are crossed, or you're not paying attention, or you're looking at your phone, that nonverbal stuff really, really matters a lot. If you're having a serious discussion with somebody and you need to, to make a decision, and you need to justify that decision, you need to look them in the eye, you need to observe active listening, right? These are all techniques that are out there. They're soft skills, they can be learned if you don't know them, but they're very, very important when you have these discussions. Your credibility will go up um, if you can learn how to use nonverbal to your advantage. And look for other influencers. When you're trying to justify a decision, look for other people who have made that decision or made a similar decision and use that as a basis for your justification, you know? Another large organization did this. This is how they approached it. We're not as large as they are. However, we can do these things and we can come to a similar result, right? Very, very important to, to use basis um, for your decision making as well. And then use questions carefully. This is a really interesting one. So when somebody asks you a question and you respond with a question, they will see that as a challenge. As consultants, we see this all the time. We work with customers and we will ask them questions and they'll respond back, and we can tell if they're hostile if the first thing they respond back to us with is a question, right? We're just trying to get information as a consultant. We're your partner, we're sitting down, we're trying to figure things out for you. And if the first response to you is a defensive response that's, that, that is a question, we know that there's a problem there, and we have to break down those barriers. So use your questions carefully. Normally what I do with questions is, if I get a question back, I'll repeat what I said, and then I say, and here's why I need to, to know that, and I'll give them the explicit details. And once you do that, you can kind of help diffuse what that situation is. You can move forward a little bit, okay? But justifying your own decisions when somebody's asking you, why did you do this? Again, use your questions carefully. Don't ask them, why do you need to know that, right? Or why is that important? Or, you know, whatever questions would come to your mind. Um, think about what you would want to know and try to rephrase it. What do you use to decide? So this is a really important thing. This is something I learned as a CISO. I would make a decision, and I would go to my boss, and I'd say, make this decision. He'd, be, he'd say, okay, and it'd be fine, great, cool. Then I'd go and I'd do my thing. Maybe I had some results, or maybe I didn't to report. It didn't matter. And I'd go back, and I'd go, I made this decision. He'd go, okay, that's great. And then I'd go back, and I'd do my thing, and things would happen, and other stuff would happen, and maybe he'd ask me about it, maybe he wouldn't. You know, we'd have a one-on-one, -on -one and he'd say, hey, you made this decision on this thing, what happened? And I'd say, oh, you know, this happened. But it wasn't a good way of doing business. It was a terrible way of doing business because I had no way to tie the decisions I was making back into the things that were important to the business. And, and this is a really important concept. You want to structure your decisions, especially when it comes to justifying your decisions, in such a way that you've got guiding principles that allow you to make those decisions. Okay? Now I'm going to show you the principles that I use. This is a real eye chart. But this is the money chart. If you're gonna take a picture, take a picture of this one. These are the actual principles that I used. I finally formulated them to say, this is how I make my decisions in security, right? I focused on the business, that was number one. So each statement, by the way, there's a, there's a simple statement that I can use to, to very easily explain it. There's the extended statement below that, and then there's the, the justification for why that statement exists. So I focused on the business. So when a, when a decision would come down, and we would say, do we need to invest in identity access management? I would say, well, does it help the business? Does it ensure that information security is integrated into essential business activities? No, it doesn't really. Does it comply with relevant legal and regulatory requirements? Oh yeah, it turns out it does because we've got a requirement that says access controls are mandated. Does, uh, can we evaluate current and future information threats with identity access management? No, can't really. Can we adopt a risk-based approach? Oh yeah, we can do that, right? And then can we protect classified information and ensure proper use? Absolutely we can. So when I made that decision for identity access management, three of my five principles kicked in. And I said, yes, this is an effective decision. I am now empowered. I can now justify going to management and say, we need to spend $225,000 on identity access management 
for these reasons. Okay? Use these. I, I give them to you freely or create your own, but don't go crazy with them. Keep it to just four or five statements that you're using to make your decisions. Use those for your effective communication, especially when you're justifying those decisions. Everybody go with that? Cool. Defense, right? Sometimes you are put in a position where you have to defend your, your decision, right? So it's not about justifying. It's about actually somebody challenging you and saying, you made this decision and I think it's a bad decision. Why did you do that? Right? And so now you're in a corner, and now you've got to think up, okay, how am I going to do this? Now, good decision makers will have already formulated their defense strategy, especially when they're dealing with management, especially when they're dealing with budgets. They'll have a strategy in mind, and they'll say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to defend it. So the really interesting thing for me is I read a blog post by a UX designer. And I was reading through this whole thing, and the UX designer was talking about how they defend their decisions when they're doing their job. As, as UX designers. And it was really fascinating to me, and I was like, you know what, we can learn a lot from this, just in general, not just in InfoSec, but in general, about how we can, we can um, defend our decisions. So the first thing the guy said is, he said, hey, stay calm but attentive, which is very important. Again, it's that emotional place, right? When you are defending your decision, don't get all angered up. Don't get all emotional about it. It's a decision. You're just talking about the decision. That's all you're talking about. You don't want any of the emotion that's in it. But you have to be attentive, too, because if things are happening around that, if conversations are happening that are, is going to cause you to change gears, you need to understand what that is. But it's a, but it's a really good, really uh, important thing to stay calm, just to, to zone into what you're trying to do, what you're trying to defend, and not you know go, go outside the boundaries of that. Remind anyone questioning the results that you went through a process to get there. And then he asks, you did go through a process to get there, didn't you? And that goes back to that information hierarchy. Did you make this from gut instinct, or did you make it based on data and information? Okay, very, very important. And if you have a process and a process rigor, and if you have something like guiding principles, the answer to that question is yes. I do have a process in which I went through. I went through each of my guiding principles, and I said, is this something that, that is required? What is it the business needed? How did, I just, how did my uh, regulatory concerns come in? Right? Uh, how did it impact my risk awareness? Recall all the work, feedback, and rounds of iterations that went into the current design being called into question. Now, it's possible that you're making decisions that don't go through this rigor. It's possible that you're making a decision that is only going through the first round of rigor. And it's also possible that that decision will get shot down, which means you're going to go through it again. But that's, that's the learning lesson. That's what you want to take with you. Go back through that, have another iteration, have another round, have a lessons learned, understand what it is that didn't happen the first time, bring it through the second time, and now you've got something in which to defend your decision. Hey, we went through several iterations of this. We, we talked to several vendors, right? We did a bake-off with vendor products. We figured out what it is we needed to do, and here's the, what we came up with, right? If you ever are involved in a vendor bake-off, create a little scorecard if, if it's not something you already have. So procurement departments will do this a lot. Procurement departments will say, Tell us why this vendor is the best vendor. And, you know, it's usually things like they gave us the best price, um, you know, we get the most um, product from them, there's this and this and this. It's very hard to articulate value to procurement because they're just a dollars and cents organization. That's all they care about. So you internally want to create something that's going to give you the ability to talk to that procurement person and to talk to your management and defend your decision to say, this is what we did. So create a scorecard that says, hey, um, this is how much effort it is to implement this thing as one of your points. This is how much value it's going to deliver, uh, not just to IT, but out to other areas of the organization, right? This is um, the, the kinds of, of things it's going to, it's going to uh, apply to our future integrations. These are all important things, and just score it. Give it, give it a little scoring, one to five, whatever you want, but create a little scorecard and have that. Have that documentation as something you can pull out to defend justification, because I will tell you, or sorry, to defend decision making, because I will tell you, documentation is really, really important. It will make or break you in the end. And it's something we always leave to last, always. I've been doing this now for two years, and I have not yet had a customer where I've walked in and said, show me the documentation that supports this, and they could produce it. They have a lot of documentation, but it doesn't really mean anything, right? Meaningful documentation, very, very, very important. So the designer here says, challenge the challenger. 
If there's no user base and bank of usage statistics, then all the questioning is driven by opinion, because that could be right. Somebody may be challenging your decision and ask you to defend it purely based on their opinion of what that thing is and not based on the data. So what he's saying here is have the data available. Have the data available to say this is why. Again, your guiding principles, your vendor scorecard, these are all inputs and data that you can use to say these are the things I use to make my decision, right? And, and put it in a defensible posture. Um, I repeat, in the absence of data, all questioning is speculative. Totally agree with that. It is speculative. It's, it's opinion based. It's emotion based, right? I don't think that's the right decision. Why? Because I don't think so. Okay. Well, here's why I think it is. And I can show you with my scorecards. Site analytic data, site feedback, or lack thereof. And that's an important thing too. If, for example, you're embarking on an initiative and there is market data to suggest that that initiative is a good initiative, you can use that to your advantage. But a lot of people don't do it the other way. A lot of people don't say, hey, you know what? There's really no data here. But that could just support your decision either way. That could just support a decision to not go with something, or that could support a decision to go with something. In the negative, to not go with it, there's no data, we don't know what's going to happen, that's a pretty obvious thing. But in the positive, there's no data, this is uncharted territory, we could be a market changer. We could move into this and really do something cool with this, right? That can be your friend. So use those tools for your, for your defense. Story wins. This is so important. So security, uh, storytelling in security is a really, really important thing. And the story is always going to win, especially when you are doing decisions in, with uh, any kind of defense. You're going to tell a compelling story about your problem. This is the problem I was trying to solve. This is the research I did. And you're going to give others that knowledge and impart on them the understanding of what you did to solve the problem. Right? So we've taken the knowledge of the decision, we've taken the documentation, we've put some process rigor around that, and we're able to construct that into a story and say, this is the story. That is a very, very compelling thing. And security needs more of that, right? So if you are a good storyteller, or if you want to start to tell good stories, put these things together, write it out, write it like a work of fiction. That's OK. Tell that story back. I guarantee you're going to get very different results than what you have right now if you're not doing that. And then in the face of ordinary, or sorry, in the face of contrary proof of success or failure, don't be afraid to change your mind. It's very, very possible that maybe you made the wrong decision. Or maybe the decision isn't as strong as it could be. When you're defending your decision, you just have to understand that your position is not absolute. That you can, in fact, say, you know, I agree with that. I'll give you an example. I have a customer right now. And I gave a finding to them about their, their wireless capability. And they came back and said, I challenge that. I don't think that that's a proper finding. And I said, well, I, you know, I, you've paid me to, to find these gaps for you. What is it you want to do? And he said, I want to talk about this, and I want to determine why it is you think this is a finding. So we had some back and forth. He gave me a bunch of technical specifications of why their wireless uh, structure was solid. I accepted that. I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. It is solid. I'm talking about this one other piece that none of this really applies to. And when I showed that back to him and he understood what it is that I was trying to say, he said, you know what, you're absolutely right. So in a way, we were both right, right? But defending your decision in the absence of proof or success or failure, don't be afraid to change your mind. Anybody know who this person is? So this is a guy by the name of Bob Graham. Bob Graham was a senator from Florida. And he is very, very famous for taking notes. Since 1977, Bob Graham has literally written down the notes of his life every day of his life. Every hour of his life is written in a notebook. In his library in Florida, you can go and see the notebooks that he has kept his journals in. Since 1977, so for over, what, 40 years, right? He's had notebooks. So if you remember, um, there was a time when the CIA was challenging the um, Committee on Defense. I don't remember who it was. Um, but, but it was about the, they were investigating the September 11th attacks. And um, they, the, the CIA made a statement that the uh, committee chairman, Nancy Pelosi, was disputing. She said, you were saying that you briefed me on these things. Those briefings never occurred. Well, it just so happens that Bob Graham was on that same committee. Bob Graham went back to his notebooks. 
He went to the CIA and he said, can you tell me on what dates it is that, that we had these briefings? And they said, uh, two in April of 02 and two in September. So Bob Graham went back and he said, no, three of the four dates there was no briefing because on this day I was having lunch and this is what I had and this is where I was and on this day I did this and on this day I did this. Seriously, he, he actually did this and was able to successfully defend this, this thing that was being said by the CIA. The CIA backed down. They said, yes, you're right. Bob Graham was known for such meticulous note-taking, they knew they could not defend against that. So whether they were wrong or whether it was you know, on purpose, that's not the issue here. The issue here is his reputation for being a documentarian was so significant that any decisions he was able to defend using that were solid decisions. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go to this level. You can if you're OCD and you have those things, that's fine, right? But if you can't, just remember documentation is your friend. And the longer you document something and the more history you have on it in a documented form, the better you can defend a decision that you have to make, okay? So then we exploit opportunity. Here's a really weird graphic that I found. I Googled for the word exploit and hacker, and I came up with this graphic. It said, hackers are opportunistic, what about you? I have no idea what that means, right? But I went for it, I said, okay. But exploiting opportunity is an important part of the decision making. So here's a quote. When a decision maker can take advantage of an opportunity, they can proactively, proactively reduce risks. I said that, right? But it's a good quote, because it's true. If you can recognize opportunities, and you can make decisions around those opportunities, you can, in fact, lower the risks that you're dealing with. You can lower the risks organizationally, you can lower the risks personally. The problem is actually dealing with that. So how do you recognize opportunity? And again, this is not something that, that is, is easy, right? It's something that's difficult. But if you're cued into certain things, it may become more apparent to you, especially over time, as you deal with it. So number one, opportunities aren't perfect. And this is a really important thing. A lot of people wait for that perfect opportunity. Right? The perfect opportunity to buy a stock, the perfect opportunity to sell a stock, you know, the perfect opportunity to, um, to execute a, a program initiative, all of these things. Opportunities are not perfect. Sometimes you want to take action when it's in, in an imperfect state. But that's exploiting the opportunity because if the opportunity is there, you can ride the wave. Right? It's just how high along that wave you can get depends on at what point you exploit that opportunity. The future is built with today's tools, not tomorrow's. And this is really important too. I go to clients, and we sit down, and the first thing they want to talk to me about is next generation firewalls when they don't do patching. Don't talk to me about next generation firewalls. We need to build on today's tools. We need to get you to a state right now where you can have control over your enterprise, and then we can talk about tomorrow. We can talk about what the, what the next thing will be. We can talk about the, the great initiatives that you can, that you can embark on. Right? We want you, though, to realize that what we have today is what we have today, and that's going to build out what you have tomorrow. That's an important thing. But that's opportunity. Exploit that opportunity. Recognize it. Appreciate the evolution of previous failures, without a doubt. Right? Look at how other things have failed, and look at how you can learn from what those failures are. Okay? Timing can be, usually is everything. It, that's a really important thing, and this is something that it's hard to learn. Okay? But timing is important. Sometimes when big news hits, like a large malware outbreak or a ransomware outbreak, maybe that's the time to ask for money for your budget. But maybe it's not. Because again, I go back to that fear, uncertainty, and doubt equation. It's a difficult thing with fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You don't want to look like you're exploiting the opportunity of FUD just to get money. You want to look like you're exploiting the opportunity of the outbreak to say, look, here are these things that happened. Here are the things that would have happened to us, to my colleague's point earlier. He made a great point in his talk where he said, um, you know, we started to talk about the kinds of things that could have happened to us, even though they didn't. And the more we had those discussions, the more they started to listen to us. That's exploiting opportunity. Absolutely. Talk about those things. We didn't get hit. These are the things that could have happened if it did. And have those conversations over and over and over exploit that opportunity. And intuition is real. Intuition is real. Sometimes that gut instinct is the right thing. So when you're exploiting an opportunity and the timing is there and you're sort of like, ah, maybe this is the, the, what I need to do. Maybe I need to do it right now. Trust your gut. But the other part of, of instinct is self-doubt. And self-doubt is what's going to put you in the trap. Self-doubt is what's going to get you to not exploit the opportunity. Right? 
So don't have self-doubt. Don't say, am I making the right decision? Say, is the decision I'm making the right decision to make? And if your gut says yes, you feel the timing's right, execute. Do what you need to do. If you've had all your homework done up to that point, it's an even stronger decision by the time you get there. But exploiting those opportunities, recognizing those, 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 um, those opportunities to, to do something is a very, very important thing. And then what happens when it goes bad? Okay, because it's gonna go bad, right? You probably have already seen it go bad from time to time, okay? But it does go bad, and sometimes when it goes bad, all we can do is lick our wounds and start over. So it goes back to that comment about the iterative process, learning from our failures, right? And I wanna talk to you about three very significant failures. The first one is the Kodak Corporation. So the Kodak Corporation started back in pre-1900s, and they were basically the first camera company. They were making cameras that were being used by consumers everywhere. There was a time in my life when I was a small child, I remember there wasn't a parking lot in the nation that didn't have a photomat booth in it. And a photomat booth, you would drive up, you would drop off your rolls of film into envelopes, into the photomat booth, they would take them, they would process them, and then some few days later, you drive back to the booth, they'd have your thing, you'd pay for your pictures, and oh my gosh, I got my pictures right from the booth. Right? I didn't have to send them in, which is previously what you had to do before photomat booths. You'd have to mail them in to the developer, and the developer would develop them and mail them back. Right? Kodak was everywhere. They were on their way to being the largest corporation in the world. In about 1974 or so, they developed a technology. And they said, you know what? This is a really interesting technology, and we think that people can take advantage of this. We can have people go on a cruise. We'll take pictures of them while they're on the cruise, and by the time they leave the cruise, they'll already have their pictures developed. And they'll be able to walk away with these, with these keepsakes. Remember, 1974, right? They called this CCD, or digital technology. Kodak invented it. Here's the problem. The decision makers at the time, who were making the money, almost the number one corporation in the world, were making all their money off of film development. And they saw digital camera technology as being the killer to film development. So they killed it. They sold off the patents, they sold off the rights, they wanted nothing to do with it. Kodak today is a shadow of the corporation it was in, in those times, right? This was a very, very bad decision. They did not see the future, they only focused on the, on the now. And it was a difficult position to be in. Kmart. Kmart has gone through many tumultuous things, but the first part of their big downfall was when they were competing against an upstart company called Walmart. And Kmart and Walmart were dealing in the same spaces. They were catering to the same uh, uh, class of people, to the same uh, economies. They were building their stores in the same places. The difference is what were, Walmart was focusing on an inventory system that was a just-in-time inventory system, whereby they could stock their shelves, and every time an item was removed from the shelf, the item would be replaced from the inventory system. So they didn't have to actually warehouse any of the product. They would order it as it left the shelf, order it to come in and fill those spaces almost in real time. Kmart did not have that. They didn't see that. They were still in the old way of warehousing. So they would order all their product. It would be sent to a warehouse. It would sit in the warehouse until a store called up and said, we need more of this product. They grabbed the product off the shelf, and it would go to the store, and they'd stock the store. Right? Very, very poor concept of how inventory management works. Kmart lost that war. Kmart lost a further war when Sears Holdings bought them out, and then just completely devastated them. They're at the point now where they've closed almost all their stores and they probably won't be a recognizable corporation, right? All about bad decisions. Motorola Corporation didn't believe anybody would ever want to use a smartphone. Who would want to use a smartphone, right? They were making so much money off of phone hardware, specifically flip phones, that they did not believe smartphone technology had a future. And they had a couple of patents on it that they sold off, right? One of those patents was picked up by Apple, and we know how that turned out. Right? But sometimes it happens. Sometimes bad decisions happen. Sometimes you have to deal with the results of the bad decision. Those could be fatal results, or they could be results that you can actually come back from. If you can recognize opportunity, if you can defend your decisions, if you can have all of these tools that you need in your toolbox to do the things you need to do. So, here is a little part of the talk that I like to call good decision, bad decision. Consider this photo. This is a photo I like to use actually when I talk about change management a lot to my clients. So this is in Stockholm. Um, in 1967, 
they were driving on the right-hand side of the road. And they decided that uh, the other countries around them, uh, Norway and Sweden, or sorry, uh, Norway and uh, one of the other countries there, um, were all driving on the left side of the road. And they said, okay, we can't be the only country that does this. We have to change over and drive on the left side of the road. So this is a picture that was taken at 4.50 a.m. on September 3rd, 1967, when all of the traffic was stopped and everybody was told to flip to the other side of the road. Now, keep in mind what has to happen. To get everybody to get to the other side of the road, they had to switch street signs, they had to switch stoplights, they had to change major parts of their infrastructure to do this. This was a moment caught in time when they were ready to execute and they said, okay, let's do it. This is an interesting, chaotic kind of thing. But what a lot of people don't realize is two hours after this photo was taken, everybody was driving on the left-hand side of the road and everything was fine. So it only took them two hours in the cause of the switch to get them to get to where they needed to go. It was probably a good decision for them. This is a picture of something that somebody invented in a city to give their infants fresh air when they were living in a high-rise apartment. Is this a good decision or a bad decision? I can't say. I am the parent of four children. There are many times when I observe this scenario in my head, right? But, you know, maybe that's a good idea, maybe that's not. That's up for you to decide. Again, risk. It's all context-based, right? What are the risks? What are the rewards? How do we make these decisions? How do we justify them? What do we do? Here's a picture of the very first test of the very first bulletproof vest. Consider the points of view of each of the participants, right? The person holding the gun has to be absolutely sure that this is going to work. The person wearing the vest has to be absolutely sure this is going to work, right? But their perspectives are probably pretty different on what that actually means. What is success to the guy holding the gun? What is success to the guy wearing the vest, right? Where are you in this equation? When you're faced with this kind of situation where you've got to take that first test and succeed or fail, it's going to happen. What are the concerns of all the involved parties? Right? How about this guy? This is fairly recent. The tornado guy. The lawn's got to get mowed. Right? He can't wait for a tornado for the lawn to get mowed. So he's going to go ahead and do this. This was taken by his wife, which I think is hilarious. She's not telling him to come in. She's taking this picture of him mowing the lawn and the tornado in the background. But again, risk and reward, right? You make your decisions. Do you, do you mow the lawn because it's got to get mowed? Do you wait for the tornado? What do you do? It's entirely up to you, <laughs> right? How about this one? You have to ask yourself in this one, is this an example of really bad risk management or is it an ex example of really awesome risk acceptance? Consider what's going on. The guy is standing here. He's on roller skates. He's got a tank of gasoline that's strapped to his back. They're filling it with unleaded gas, I might add, right, to that. And he's presumably on his way to work, given how he's dressed with his briefcase. He's got to get there. He's got to get to work. He does not have time to wait around for all these shenanigans, right? So you as an InfoSec person, where are you in this equation? Are you going to tell this guy, you are crazy and stupid, and if you do this, you are risking your life? Or are you going to say, hey, can I get you a helmet or some knee pads or something that's going to help you with this? Because I still think it's crazy, but let me help you get there in a, in a safer way. Right? This is the ultimate InfoSec question. This is what you're going to base all your decisions on. Is it risk acceptance? Is it risk avoidance? How do you deal with something like this? Because this is happening to you every day. Right? Risk and roller skates. Here's a doozy. Anybody recognize these people? This is the crew of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Space Shuttle Columbia, um, in 2003, burned up on reentry, killing all the crew members aboard. The problem was there was a heating tile, actually several heating tiles, on the bottom of the shuttle that had come loose during launch. Which means, when that vehicle was ejected into space and it was doing its orbiting, the engineers at NASA sat down and they said, how bad of a problem is this? And they all came to the same conclusion, it's fatal. There is no possible way that we can bring these astronauts back to Earth safely. They are going to die. And they made a decision. They made a decision not to tell the astronauts. Because they said, is it better for them to know that they're doomed 
Or is it better for them to come back and think about what it is they're going to do so they can get home to their family safely? Where does it put them personally? That's a hell of a problem. And believe it or not, in InfoSec, we have these problems. You might be dealing with patient care. And patient care has these kinds of conundrums. Do we sacrifice patient care for security or not? It's a really difficult question. Because we see hospitals have been victims of things like ransomwares. And we see they've been victims of other things. And I've worked with doctors before, and they're notoriously bad with technology, and they're, they're terrible users, right? But it's this kind of equation that we have to deal with. They're dealing with things with risks that maybe we just don't understand. So we have to figure out what the best decision is for everybody involved, and what do we do? It's tough. So my non-exhaustive list for you of making good decisions kind of comes down to this. First of all, include relevant people in decision-making meetings and conversations. InfoSec needs to stop this too. Stop making decisions in a vacuum. Get stakeholders involved. Get people involved who can help you make a better decision, because believe it or not, you don't know everything. And some of you don't think you know everything, but you don't know what you don't know. And that's a bad part of managing risk, right? So get people involved so you can start to find out some things that you don't know, and you can make better decisions together. Know who the relevant people are, so you have to do fact-finding. You will have to go into your organizations. You're going to have to figure out who's my subject matter expert. Who knows the most about this, right? Uh, for this application, what does it do? Well, what do you need it to do? What are you trying to get back? What's your result, right? Understand those business parts of that so you can make a better decision around it. Note the exceptions. If your product manager gets his or her way with something you disagree with, make a note of it out of your work journal. This is from my UX designer. Great, great, great piece of advice there. Have your work journal. Make sure that in your journal that you're journaling why something is happening, right? That would be meeting minutes. That would be a ticketing system, right? Or that could be personal memos, personal notes. That's fine. Keep a work journal, right? Do those things. Make sure you have documented those things that you've talked about with your stakeholders. Research patterns and existing solutions and be informed of what's come before. Right? Has this worked for other people? Maybe it'll work for us. Has it not worked for other people? Maybe it'll work for us. That's part of the equation, too. Consider it. It's possible. Design in the right order. Start with a whiteboard or paper. I love drawing things. Right? Visualizing security is a great thing. Draw it out. Any of you who come from a network background, you know how important this is. You got to draw it out. Start with your whiteboard or paper. Move to your hand-drawn wireframes. Move to your hi-fi mock-ups. So if you're a UX designer or a developer, this is just iterative development. But in InfoSec, we can learn the same things. Draw it out on paper. Do a tabletop. Figure it out before you actually get to where the technology is that you're going to have to deal with to do something with it. Make your mock-ups clickable and share them with the team and potential users. Absolutely. If you can get people involved in what it is you're trying to do with your tools or your technology or your processes, get them involved. Show them. Get it interactive. Let them be part of the solution instead of just being the recipient of something they see as a problem. Right? Important thing. So I'm going to close with this. Everybody know Jeff Bezos? Okay, Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon. They have an amazing culture at Amazon. And you probably read about it. You may have read about how difficult it is to get along at Amazon, and that is part of the culture. But there's another part of the culture a lot of people don't know about, and that is disagree, disagree but commit. Disagree but commit is a philosophy they have at Amazon that says this. Let's say we're in a meeting, and you and I disagree about a topic. We will talk about it for some amount of time that we're going to put time limits on, say 30 minutes. At the end of that 30 minutes, if I still have not gotten to your position, I am going to disagree with you but commit to your action and move on. And we're not going to belabor the points, and we're not going to draw this out, and, and it's not going to be problems anymore. This is an amazing thing, and it has caused Amazon to make amazing things. Jeff Bezos himself said, I have been involved in this. I have been part of product discussions or product line discussions where I did not think the company would go, but I decided to disagree but commit. I trusted my managers, and they executed on their products. This takes a very healthy culture of trust, and you may not have that. But you should try to build to it. You should try. Disagreeing is fine. There's nothing wrong with disagreeing. Committing makes you move forward. And if you can commit as a team, if you can commit together as a unit, then you're going to move forward together greater. So I like this. I like disagree but commit. And I'm trying to instill this in all the engagements I have with all my customers, I'm trying to instill it in my own culture. Let's disagree but commit. We're going to move forward, even though we disagree. That's all I have for you today.
Anybody have any questions? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a mic here. So, one of the points you made was try and avoid FUD, stay positive when you're trying to, you know, get your point across. How do you do that while trying to seize on a moment, like, you know, a few weeks ago, want to cry or anything like that? Because even if you try and spin it positively and says, this is what happened, this is who it happened to, what could have happened to us, and so you're trying to say it's positively, but you're mm -hmm. still kind of on that line of, right. you know, fear. Yep. You have to show the benefit of what it is you're trying to, to do, right? So so it's about, okay, you'll have this discussion. You'll say, hey, you probably heard about this thing. You probably heard about this wanna cry thing. It's everywhere. Everybody talked about it. Um, this is what happened. This is what we look like, and if we had been attacked, this is what would have happened to us, right? It would have been this major outbreak. It would have cost us all kinds of time and resources, but don't just say all kinds of time and resources. Have that out. Go look. You know, we would have spent the majority of, of all these people's time trying to solve this. It probably would have taken two weeks. You can do a little forecasting in that. And then, and then when you get to where you're trying to seize that opportunity, you can say, look, and because this is happening and we know it's going to continue to happen because this thing is going to morph and, and there's variants and other things that are going to happen, we want to do this thing, which is going to protect us from that happening. So you've got to show the value or the benefit of what it is you're trying to sell to that, that thing that you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Right? So, so you took it pretty far. You just have to take it a little bit farther and go, this is the value of what we're trying to do. And maybe it, maybe it requires an investment. And here's the thing. If it requires an investment, make sure that you understand the investment. Because if, for example, I can invest in the technology, and maybe we're talking about this one thing. We're talking about WannaCry, and it's going to help us there. But it also helps us with this and this and this and this and takes away these problems. That's a big deal, right? All of a sudden, you've got a value equation and you've got positive return on investment. Things happen for you, right? It's an important thing. Did that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, business cards here. If anybody who wants to grab one, please come and connect with me. I'm more than happy to talk to you. Thanks.